When we sit down, it's time for the conversation. And joining me in studio is Ambassador Rastas Mwancha, who's the former deputy chairperson to the African Union. Thank you very much for making time. Thank you very much for having me, Ondero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Today we want to have a very interesting conversation. We want to unpack the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. But before we go into the nitty gritties, we know previously Nigeria was a little bit hesitant about signing the agreement. And when they went to Niger, uh, we saw President Buhari signing the agreement and it was officially launched. What do you make out of all this? Well, it's not a big deal, uh, the fact that Nigeria didn't sign because um, Nigeria explained that they had to go to cabinet, mm -hmm. to the business community, to parliament, to make sure that they obtained concurrence and, uh, and the goodwill of the people of Nigeria before the president signed on behalf of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we are now seeing that there's a new dawn in the continent in the way we'll be doing trade because we will be one trading block. However, one can't help but wonder, what happens to our regional trading blocks, ECOWAS, SADAC, COMESA, EAC? If you go back to the design of these regional uh, groupings or regional economic groupings, they were designed to be building blocks of the African Union, um, which ultimately will swallow them. So that once you have the African Union being an economic community, Mm -hmm. these regional blocks will disappear. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. And there has also been a question of regional integration. We haven't been very vibrant in terms of uh, the position of regional blocks and uh, what they're doing and how first they're doing it and their impact. How does the AFTCA come in and impact this? The, F uh, the Africa continent of free trade areas benefited a lot from the experiences of the regional economic uh, groupings. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I mean, as you remember, I used to be Secretary General yeah. of Comesa, and uh, going to the Africa Union, that benefited the African Union to be able to put in place a program that now has been launched because mm -hmm. we used the experience of Comesa to design the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area has several components in it, and they're called protocols. And I'd like us to discuss some of these protocols very briefly. Let's start with the protocol on trade. Yeah, the protocol on trade, uh, first of all, there are two aspects of trade. You have what you call trade in goods mm -hmm. and trade in services. And uh, trade in goods, you look at two aspects. There's what you call tariffs. Mm -hmm. Countries will come and say, for the goods that will enter our territory, we are willing to remove up to 100% tariffs so that they can come in duty free and you can say 85% of the goods that come into Kenya, you say all those goods would be duty free. Mm -hmm. uh, then you can leave tariff lines of goods that you probably may want to protect mm -hmm. or you want to impose certain uh, periods of time before you allow imports into the country. Mm -hmm. That's what you call an offer which then becomes part of the protocol. Okay. And that's what countries are doing. Mm -hmm. Then trade in services is also negotiated. Uh, services include quite a number of elements. Mm -hmm. You're talking of free movement of people, you're talking of although it's not a service as such, that's a protocol on its own. But a person, for instance, if you are going to move as a lawyer, as a doctor, as an engineer, uh, you are moving with your, your, your technical skills, but you need to move across the border. Mm -hmm. So that is negotiated as part of that package. But there are services like airlines, uh, you know, you trade across banking, internet facilities. Those are all negotiated mm -hmm. so that, for instance, if you go to Uganda, you pay the same or you don't have to pay an additional cost because you have crossed the border. Okay. Yeah. And then there's also the protocol on dispute settlement. We know a country like Eritrea did not come on board because of the conflict it had with Ethiopia. Sudan has been having conflict with South Sudan. And many other African countries are at war with each other. How does the protocol on dispute settlement work? That's one of the major um, beneficiaries of having a trade arrangement of this nature. You must put in a mechanism for dispute settlement. Mm -hmm. uh, a dispute may arise, for instance, if a country feels that the products coming to the country do not originate in that 
place uh, where they are assumed to have come from so that you are able to go in inspect mm -hmm. if you find those goods that don't come from that area you can then go to the dispute settlement to say those products will not come mm -hmm. or you ban them okay uh, if you don't have that you have unilateralism mm -hmm. and this is the kind of approach you have seen for instance uh, what the u.s is using against china yeah. instead of going to the wto to say oh we 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 suspect that huawei has violated certain trade arrangements the u.s just bans that is unilateralism but when you have that arrangement it enables particularly for the smaller countries because not all countries are going to be the size of us that you can pull those that you can have a mechanism that like having a court system that if you and i disagree if we cannot reach a, an agreement on the, our disagreement we go to court mm -hmm. and that court helps us mm -hmm. that's what you call a dispute settlement mechanism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is good when there's peace then we can do business however for business to thrive the environment has to be right and the african continent has some of the challenges that it needs to address before the agreement becomes a success now before the show we were having a conversation on uh, non-tariff barriers and tariff barriers let's begin with tariff barriers so many african countries have complained that tariffs between nations and nations in the African continent are so high that they prefer bringing goods from outside the continent because the tariffs are fair. That's true. Mm -hmm. In fact, on average, if I remember the last time when I looked at statistics, mm -hmm. uh, intra-African trade tariffs attracted about 12%, but if you imported goods from outside Africa, it was around 8%, meaning we prefer to import things from outside Africa than from Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do we fix that moving forward? By removing these tariffs, when you create a continent of free trade area, you have to remove that 12% to make it zero, but you keep the 80% for goods coming from outside. Mm -hmm. That is how you remove and that's how Europe has done. But don't you think there will, there will be kind of a discord countries are used to getting this kind of revenue and then you take away that revenue from them? It is a misnomer, and I can tell you this for a fact because having been, and, I, I, and I'm ready for any challenge, mm -hmm. Secretary General of Comesa, we experienced this mm -hmm. when we were launching the, con the Comesa Free Trade Area. People cried wolf to say, look, if you remove, because on average, if you look at the Kenya Revenue uh, uh, you know, Authority, in terms of revenue that come into the country, mm -hmm. uh, tariffs constitute a major revenue to the country. So if you, the goods that are coming in, you remove tariffs, yes, you are going to have a revenue, a revenue loss. But you forget one thing. Mm -hmm. If those goods are going to come from within Africa, they create an economic activity. Mm -hmm. And, and th there are some other uh, taxes that are paid because you have created an ec economic ac activity that compensates mm -hmm. the tariff. Mm -hmm. In fact, at the moment, many developing countries don't depend on revenue on, on, on tariffs as a source of national revenue. Mm -hmm. That is declining. In fact, it's becoming an obsolete mm -hmm. because we are moving towards almost uh, zero trade in that. The challenge is really the non-tariff barriers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, we want to talk about the non-tariff barriers and one of the key challenges is infrastructure. And we had this conversation and I've even mentioned it in the first part for those who are just joining into the conversation. 80 to 90 percent of goods in the African continent move by roads. Yet our road connectivity is only 24 percent. We were talking about open skies and stuff like that. But even in the country, we are having problems with our airline, uh, the waters. We are having problems with that marine. How do we go about this challenge to ensure that we harness the power that comes with the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement? Absolutely correct. In fact. The fact that we don't trade with each other has nothing to do with uh, with the, the tariffs that we have just talked about. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the non-tariff barriers, because, and the non-tariff barriers are many. It has to do with the the state of our infrastructure. If you look at, for instance, if you move goods from Mombasa port to say Kigali, you add about over fifty percent on top of the cost of the product. You add fifty percent just simply moving from Mombasa to Kigali. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in Europe, a similar distance, you probably add only 80%. So that's why it's so difficult for, for, for Africa to trade with each other because of the barriers. Beyond that, when you cross the border, uh, Africa sometimes 
you may find because we have different regimes of even infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, if you drive to, Uganda, to Ethiopia, you cannot drive with your vehicle all the way to Addis Ababa. You can only reach uh, Mayale and leave the vehicle there because it's left-hand drive in Ethiopia, Kenya is right-hand drive. Mm -hmm. So you have to do transshipment. Sometimes you may reach there and then they tell you, no, the product you have are, uh, are marked in English. You have to mark them in Amharic. Mm -hmm. That you don't have, mm -hmm. so you can't sell. Okay. Or the standards. Mm -hmm. So there are many barriers. When you harmonize those kind of things, that's why, for example, if you remember Nigeria, mm -hmm. being in West Africa, which is largely uh, dominated by left-hand drive, Nigeria decided to go left-hand drive so that the woods vehicles can move within West Africa, as an example. Mm -hmm. So that is the process of integration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about security. Because when you're talking about moving from country to country, there are borders. One, we'll touch on borders and how they hinder trade and movement of people. Because sometimes crossing over borders can be very bureaucratic. And two, the challenge of security. Because we know Kenya, uh, our borders are not open. But we still face the imminent uh, uh, attacks on terror and stuff like that. Nigeria has that challenge. How do we ensure that we are ahead of the security challenge that comes with opening our borders to everyone and anyone? That's a red herring in terms of talking of trade mm -hmm. and security. Because even without trade, the terrorists will move. So... I, I don't like normally to, to, to really mix the two. Yeah. But if you want me to address that aspect, yes. Uh, you see, when you allow free movement of people, mm -hmm. as, as I was giving you an example, if you are moving, say, from Mombasa to Kisumu, and you are a terrorist, if you are the counties, we don't have boundaries that check, uh, does that... Uh, make it worse because the Nairobi didn't check that if you passed through here you would have been a terrorist? No. I mean, think of Africa that way. If you think of Europe, they are still getting attacks. Some of the airports are being attacked. U.S. is being attacked in spite of the fact that those terrorists will not have come because of trade. My the point terrorists, is most of the terrorists could be even homegrown. Mm -hmm. uh, they could be facilitated through other means. Mm -hmm. So let's not mix it. I heard people say, look, uh, because of visa restrictions, I mean, lifting visa, allowing people to move, or you are going to uh, make it easier for terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is a scare, you know, I, I would call it herring, mm -hmm. so that people don't think about the big picture, mm -hmm. and we start uh, talking about the small things. Now, Talking about the good things and the big picture, the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement looks very promising for business people, for countries and economies. And you know, um, Kenyans might be here wondering, what is the need for me and what is the need for this country? However, um, we spoke to one gentleman named Tebe, who's the founder of Brand 100 Africa. And when he was launching the top brands in Africa, he had uh, two or three things to say about the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement and what it will do to businesses. Take a look. Okay. We do not need the rest of the world. We can just do business in Africa as Africans and we'll be just fine. No, I think we'll need the rest of the world. I mean, this, this Trumpism and the rest that says now we, we are okay, we can't, uh, uh, we don't need anybody else, is not right. Mm -hmm. We still continue to need uh, the global family. Mm -hmm. But of course the fact is that, and, and you had very good statistics when you talked of, say, palm oil. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about, uh, there's another product you mentioned. Uh, Kenya is the largest producer of flowers. Flowers. Yeah. Uh, let me give you an example of what is happening at the moment. As part of the non-tariff barriers to trade, now the world is starting to say, if you move certain fresh products by plane, the carbon print is so big that they don't buy them. In fact, they are going to put 
a special tariff on it because it has moved. In fact, there's a tax coming if you fly because they say you are uh, affecting the global environment. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you will soon discover that our fresh beans, when they are in Europe, our flowers, people are not buying them now. They are saying, ah, but this is now part of global climate change. Mm -hmm. And so, but you can only sell goods, perhaps, which have gone by ship, because for them, they will not see a huge carbon print with it. Now, that is one aspect that is coming that we must prepare ourselves. Mm -hmm. So instead of flowers going all the way to Amsterdam and then back to Lagos, Lagos why don't we take them direct? Uh, but I can see that is not even going to be a long-term sustainable product. Mm -hmm. But there's quite a number of other things that we can talk about in, okay. in terms of trade. Go ahead. Um, take the case of tea. Mm -hmm. um, if you buy tea anywhere in Europe or in Africa, you'll probably find it written Lipton. Have you ever seen Kenya exporting a tea called Lipton? No. They will take the, the tea from Kenya, take the tea from other places, mm -hmm. add value and sell. Mm -hmm. But have you ever seen the Dakar from uh, Japan, Toyota, you come and sell it in a different Kenyan name? No. no. So that is part of the, you know, the, the unfair global trade system. So it that has our to be products Mm -hmm. are uh, not even being traded by their own names. Yeah. They are being traded because somebody is adding value and trading and they are taking the benefit. I'll just give you global statistics. Mm -hmm. Any commodity that we export in terms of rocks or agricultural products, we only get about 15% of that value. 85% exactly. remains in those value chains uh, you know, along the before it reaches a consumer. Mm -hmm. But if we were able to control our own product and sell it as a final product, we will be getting even much richer. So but that's not the whole story for creating a continent of free trade area. Mm -hmm. A continent of free trade area is also looking at uh, the size of the continent. Mm -hmm. At the moment, you can only talk of our individual countries, the yeah. Kenya size, mm -hmm. Burundi size. Uh, Zambia size, okay. which are very small for economies of scale. Mm -hmm. But for the continent, and you had very good statistics, you can attract larger investment. Mm -hmm. You can be able to go into transformation of this uh, material you're exporting to manufactured goods, which you can't do at the moment. Mm -hmm. Because if you do for the small market, which is called import substitution, they would be very costly. Speaking of that, we went out to the streets and we asked Kenyans what they think about Kenyan products because if we have to compete competitively, even in the African market, our goods have to be up to standard. Correct. This is what Kenyans had to say. Take a look. There you go. Chinese products are very famous in the Kenyan market. You are right. Um, and, and do you know what the reason China is uh, dominating the world? Mm -hmm. If you look at the process of industrialization, it started actually from UK, mm -hmm. uh, where they were taking cotton from here, go and make, say, textiles and export. Mm -hmm. They moved to Netherlands and the rest, and they started making machinery. But those industries then started moving to East. Now you find they are anchored in countries like China. By the way, China is now giving up some of those manufacturing because they are now moving to a higher value product. Mm -hmm. China is able to manufacture planes. They are now able to manufacture the fourth generation of industry, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence and the rest. So some of the industries are moving away from China, particularly the labor intensive. That's why they moved away from Europe. Africa should position itself to do that. By 2030, we will be 1.7 billion people. Correct. We'll have the labor force. Correct. How do we make uh, take advantage of the market? 
that is one of the things that let's create that market let's start talking about infrastructure remove the non tariff barriers improve your standards uh, let's go into uh, education particularly skills mm -hmm. that we can train skills because at the moment if you look at Africa under what we call agenda 2063 mm -hmm. we looked at the profile of how Africa should develop between now and 2063. What Africa needs to get there. The Africa we want. The Africa we want. In terms of skills, whether it's doctors, engineers, uh, electricians, whatever, plumbers. And you know, I can give you that Africa is shortage. is huge in terms of those skills, uh, running into millions and millions. So let's massify the, the, the skills we need mm -hmm. because our education system unfortunately has tended to be one of liberal and uh, we went for qu quantity in terms of quality mm -hmm. so that we can be able to have the people that can take us to the fourth industrial generation but in in transit to that we can harness what china is giving up because china is also going now europe way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now when we are talking about manufacturing and growing, we must also be cognizant of the fact that some of these industries are being driven by the private sector. And when we are talking about the agreement, we have to factor in how the private sector is going to come in and how it's going to benefit. Now, the EABC had something to say about this. Take a look. Because of the high taxes that governments or partners have around this, they must ensure that private sector is at the center of this negotiation. How do governments ensure that the private sector is at the center of this agreement? I can tell you that uh, even when we were doing the commercial free trade area, mm -hmm. the Kenya delegation was always accompanied by Kenya Association of Manufacturers mm -hmm. or Kenya National uh, Commerce, Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Okay. They are always part and parcel of that because it is they that know the kind of goods that the country produces, it is they, they know, that know the taxes and so forth. But it's not just enough for them to be in the negotiation uh, in a room, mm -hmm. because ultimately, of course, uh, if you look at the WTO, the agreement is structured that is agreement between the governments, but the negotiations can be supported by all parties. In mm -hmm. fact, if you look at under the WTO agreed, uh, arrangements, for instance, when you're talking of pharmaceuticals, behind the U.S. delegation is always at the pharmaceutical industries because that's what they produce and they want to protect that. Mm -hmm. It is really also the partnership that must be there at the national level. And for instance, the Kenya, now you have the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, where they should always be in partnership with the state, mm -hmm. cover out what is our entry point into global trade, what are our competitive our, our competitive age mm -hmm. and what are, do we need to look internally mm -hmm. to, to correct so that we can be competitive. Okay. So that conversation must start at the national level and always watch yourself against best practices globally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll be taking a tweet by a very interesting gentleman who's called Kwame Wiener. He's the um, chairperson of the Institute of Economic Affairs. But just before we go on to that tweet, I want to stay with the private sector and just say, you're saying we, there are some things that we need to do right. For example, one of those things is ensuring that there are financial uh, services and extension services to businessmen and SMEs. How do we ensure that even at the continental level, we have banks that can lend to these people, that they can be able to mm create products that will fit into the African need. Okay. Uh, you know, one of the things that you, you realize in terms of global uh, trade systems, mm -hmm. uh, a country must then know where you edge your competition and, and support your local industry so that the ecosystem around that product you are e exporting is supportive. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things, for instance, some countries are starting to adopt is what you call special economic zones, mm -hmm. where you make sure then that those companies are not overburdened by bureaucracy, by taxes, by, you know, you, you improve the infrastructure around it so that you make it. But rather than do it for these enclaves, mm -hmm. the economy should always be having that kind of conversation. What is it that we can do? for us to position ourselves 
to be able to do better in the uh, uh, export of certain products. You saw in Tanzania the other day, the president so much concerned that the farmers, you are exporting uh, cashew, but the farmers are not getting the right price. Mm -hmm. And so you want to get the right price. But because you want, you are not in charge of the entire supply chain and the value chain, you may try to, to tackle one aspect of those who are buying without controlling down the road who's adding value. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that, you must then make sure that y y as a country, you, you identify where your obstacles are mm -hmm. and uh, solve them. Mm -hmm. uh, not piecemeal. I mean, the example I'm giving, to me, it looks like piecemeal. But we need now to look internally and say, we export tea. How do we make sure that our tea is branded, is understood, is, is protected in the market. You can see what the U.S. is doing with their products. Mm -hmm. They protect them uh, seriously to make sure that they maintain the manufacturing edge, which is not necessarily good for the world, but it means that at the national level you become that selfish, but position yourself so that you occupy that position. Great. Mm -hmm. Now, very many people are very positive about the agreement, but some are a little bit lax because of some of the challenges that we have in terms of leadership, in terms of governance. And Kwame Wiener, who's the CEO of the Institute of Economic Affairs, put out this tweet immediately the, um, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement was signed. If we could have the tweet up on screen, there you have it. It says, it's too early to say that Africa is destined to become a free trade area. This continent has special leaders and bureaucrats wedded to protectionism and crony capitalists. What are your two cents? I know uh, Kwame very well. I, he's, he's a media personality and uh, a good commentator. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and sometimes it's good to have that kind of uh, uh, the, uh, what you might call the outlier who, who also make us think hard. Um, and I'm not naive to think that the free trade area is going to be uh, impactful tomorrow. Yeah. It's going to take time. Mm -hmm. But I also want to run away from a self-condemnation that says uh, because we, we have done the, the things in the past, that's how Africa should continue to be. In that case, you surrender and go home. Mm -hmm. Is that what is implying? Mm -hmm. I think what is implying is that how do we then now tackle these obstacles so that we can realize it. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, if you look at history... How do we tackle those obstacles? If you look at history of what has happened, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember when we started the Commerce of Free Trade Area, mm -hmm. Intra-African trade was less than one billion. Mm -hmm. It was just 800 million. But within a short time, it rose to three, now it's ten, whatever it is, billion. Meaning that the small obstacles that have been removed, you have seen that trade move. Mm -hmm. I mean, Egypt used to import tea from somewhere else. Kenya used to import uh, a number of building material from somewhere else. Uh, Zambia was importing from Egypt. We saw that trade take place, and it's still taking place. Mm -hmm. So let's, it, it, is, it is not an event that you, you have launched the free trade area, things are going to happen tomorrow. It is a process. Mm -hmm. And I think we are taking positive steps and Africa must come to a point we ask ourselves, are we going to sit in this kind of situation with unemployment, with the youth purge, and, and uh, survive? You've seen in Europe now, yellow vests, people say capitalism has failed, and this is what is, is attacking. Mm -hmm. And we must also ask ourselves, can we have these cronies sitting on on, 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 you know, doing nothing, mm -hmm. uh, Africa will change. Well, how sober are we when we are electing our leaders? Mm -hmm. Are we sober when we are looking for sober leaders? Or what kind of people are we putting in office? We'd like to sh take a short breather, but when we come back, that's the time for Social Watch. My opinion, zero. It's you telling us what you think. We're talking about the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. We've been unpacking it to the Ambassador Erastas Mwenja, who was the deputy, uh, the former deputy chairperson of the African Union. When we come back, we'll be sampling some of your views. So during the break, log on to our social media platforms at Metropole TVKE across all digital platforms. Hashtag Metropole Debrief at Ndiro Ganga at Erastas Mwenja.